So uh, we're gonna wait uh, a minute to start it, but meanwhile, I'm gonna take the opportunity to introduce myself. So I'm uh, Bia Carlini. I'm the Northwest ATTC coordinator, um, among several other things I, I, I do at ATTC. Um, and I'm gonna host the webinar today. Uh, as the slide says, we are gonna take questions in the end but you can type there anytime. We are just gonna uh, get them all uh, as we finished. Also, many of you always ask us, we are recording this webinar. The webinar will be made available in our website, uh, in uh, also in an ADA, ADA uh, compliant recording. Uh, usually we take two days uh, because of some uh, travel from our staff, we expect to have that up in our website by uh, Monday. Okay, so let's get started then. Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we realize we serve a diverse audience and that also serves a very diverse population. So we recognize words matter and uh, we strive to respect diversity in our work. If you have any comments or suggestions about this webinar uh, in this regard, please contact us. There is a, our email on there. We are, we'll be happy to hear and learn uh, from you. That being said, today we are lucky to have our webinar presenter, uh, Troy Montserrat Gonzalez. She's a licensed counselor and medical anthropologist. Uh, she's also currently uh, the Behavior Health and Addictions Program Manager at Multnomah County Health Department. She also maintains a private counseling and coaching practice in Portland, Oregon, where she specializes in working with human services uh, profession. Uh, so that being said, uh, we are now transferring uh, the the control of the screen to you, Troy, and thanks so much uh, for uh, doing this, and uh, you can get it started after you click. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thanks, Bia. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. So hi, everyone. So I just wanna thank you all for joining today. So the, we the webinar, as you can read, uh, is called Healing the Healer. So today we're gonna be talking about employing principles of neuroscience, CBT, and MI to understand and treat compassion fatigue among human service professionals. So I also just wanna unpack our alphabet soup a little bit and not assume that anybody have any pre-existing knowledge. So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy and MI stands for Motivational Interviewing. So I'm really excited to present this information to you today. I also wanna let you all know that I'm presenting this information very much for people to use with themselves and with their colleagues in the workplace. So I'll be using sort of us as a pronoun very frequently. Um, I'll also be presenting information about things like compassion fatigue, concepts of resiliency, self-care in light of neuroscience research and giving us an opportunity to benefit from some of the tools and techniques that many of us currently use or may have used before in our work with clients. So too often, um, we think of self-care or healing from compassion fatigue as something that we do outside of our work time, something that we're sort of tasked to do in our personal lives for the benefit of our professional lives. But I think for this type of health and wellness in the workplace to be really successful and effective, we need to develop some understanding and some practices that we can really employ in the workplace in the very moment that we're experiencing stress or difficulties. Um, and these tools need to be accessible, intuitive, and not really very resource or time consuming. So hopefully uh, we'll be learning things that can support that work today. So why this topic? Why now? Why again? Many of us probably already know much of what I'll be talking about. Um, and like I said just now in the intro, some of this information will probably be, probably be new, but likely we'll be reminding ourselves of what we already know and what we already do. And this practice of 
learning new information, and also um, practicing what we already know coordinates or kind of piggybacks on the idea of, hold on just a second, I just had a little bleep in my computer. Here we go. So piggybacks on this idea of plasticity. Um, and I think it's helpful to think of plasticity in two different ways. So we think of plasticity in terms of what we often hear is plasticity in terms of neuroplasticity. So now that brain research and neuroscience are becoming uh, more prevalent, more in the forefront of our knowledge as a society and more common knowledge, not just professional knowledge, we see this word plasticity. So as it's typically used, plasticity refers to this ability of our brain and central nervous system to change in response to experience throughout our entire lives, not just during certain developmental phases. I think it's also helpful to think about the term behavioral plasticity. I think of behavioral plasticity as our ability or an organism's ability to change behavior and make changes in behavior from exposure to stimuli such as changing environmental conditions. And those conditions can be things that happen to us or things that we facilitate and do on purpose. So I believe that this topic of compassion fatigue, workplace resiliency, really ties into this notion of plasticity. Because what we'll be doing today is supporting the plasticity of our brains and central nervous systems. Just by sitting here, um, just by taking the time out of your very busy schedules to sit here and consider this information today, um, I think you're supporting your brain and central nervous systems in, in developing um, new pathways that will be supportive of, of your mental health and wellness. At least I hope so. So the next slide. So in terms of compassion fatigue, we'll talk a little bit in the next slide about exactly what that means. But first, let's talk a little bit about why. Um, I think in the human services world, in the work that many of us do, we're exposed to what we call acute and ongoing stress. So acute and ongoing stress um, has sort of has a cumulative, a cumulative effect on us and on our bodies and on our relationships. So it's not a surprise that stress is bad for us. Um, many of us work in cortisol-driven environments, and I don't even think that's unique to human services professionals, but many of us work in very stress and crisis-laden environments. And this is because we're either working directly with folks who have been traumatized or are being traumatized, going for, through di very difficult, painful situations. It can also be stressful to work in the organizations in which we work. Um, I always say as well-intentioned and as hardworking as our organizations are, for many of us, I think too often that we manage to succeed at work in spite of our work environments, not because of them. So this is another type of chronic stress that can have a cumulative negative effect on us. Um, sometimes it's referred to vicarious traumatization, especially that, that work that we do when we're working with clients who are traumatized. Um, this kind of chronic stress or the effects of this chronic stress has many uh, neurological and biological uh, effects and functions. We're not gonna go into all of them today because we only have an hour. But one important piece is that ongoing and chronic exposure to stress and stress hormones decrease expression of a component called BDNF. And BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And BDNF is a protein. It's a protein that lives in our brain. It lives in the areas around our brain. And it's really central to nerve growth. It helps support existing neurons and encourage the growth of new neurons and new synapses. So it's really central to the work of this idea of plasticity, of bounce back, of resiliency. It's also real key to long-term memory. So because of chronic stress and because of the possible decrease of this component of BDNF, and also because of many other physiological reasons, 
when we're exposed to chronic stress, we might also experience depressed learning, uh, difficulty memory, memory, remembering things, immunosuppression, so our immune system can be real fragile, we can get sick a lot, um, experience behavioral health symptoms like depression and anxiety. We also can consider um, epigenetic factors can get activated. So by epigenetic, um, many of us have probably heard this word before, we think of genetic factors that are beyond just our genes, um, beyond just what we inherit from our family. So other factors in our environment that coordinate or combine with our genetic factors to sort of, I call it flip the switch. So to flip the switch and it can help or facilitate this chronic stress, the emergence of mental or physical illness that may not have been there before. So it sort of increases, chronic stress increases our risk that way. Um, we can also have a lack of interest in and energy for other activities and relationships. It can be less effective as healers and professionals. So all of this chronic stress is just not good. So compassion fatigue. So what is it? It's something that causes chronic stress. Um, it's also known, it has a few different aliases. It's known as, we hear it referred to as burnout. Um, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as empathy fatigue. Next slide. Um, sometimes we'll hear it referred to as um, empathic distress fatigue. I don't know if many people have come across that yet, but in the scientific research about compassion fatigue, people are starting to re-envision it as empathy fatigue or uh, empathic distress fatigue. Um, and I think the reason, or as I understand it, the reason that we're calling compassion fatigue these days, empathy fatigue, is that according to brain research, empathy fatigue, fatigue might be a more accurate description of the type of burnout that those of us as helping professionals experience, since the very brain and central nervous system processes that make us feel exhausted have more to do with feeling empathy or experiencing what someone else might be feeling. So this happens thanks to our mirror neural networks um, that allow us to experience what we call empathic resonance. This is a system that actually gets fatigued when we feel burnout related to vicarious traumatization. Uh, and there can be many uh, contributing factors, um, workplace stress, world events. I don't think um, many of us would disagree that it kind of feels like we're living in a very chaotic and uncertain time right now. Um, the direct service that we do can contribute, our own life histories, our, our life sort of stressors in general. So speaking about just the neuroscience of compassion or empathy fatigue, I also want to just take a little, let's re reverse for a minute. I want to say that during this webinar, I'm going to be using compassion fatigue and empathy fatigue synonymously at the same time even though research makes a distinction between the neurological processes of the two, um, I think for our purposes, because we've been saying the words compassion fatigue for so long, um, even though people think it might not be entirely accurate, I think it's still a useful term to use, so I'm gonna keep using it throughout this presentation, so I hope nobody uh, has an objection to that. So in terms of the neuroscience of compassion or empathy fatigue, it teaches us that there are parts of the brain that simultaneously get activated in both the witness to suffering and the person experience the suffering in the moment. So the ACC or the anterior cingulate cortex and the anterior insula are two areas of the brain that actually get activated simultaneously by both parties. So it sort of helps biologically explain why we might experience empathy fatigue because we're actually experiencing similar thoughts and feelings that the traumatized individual also is experiencing. And that's very key to our, our ability to feel compassion. So it's also supportive in many ways. Um, we can also think about compassion or empathy fatigue in light of two sections of the brain. So the front of the brain and the lower brain. So the front of the brain is often referred to as the reflective part of the brain. Um, the reflective part of the brain deals with our abilities to problem solve, 
to communicate, to regulate our emotions, just that sort of higher functioning. The lower part of the brain is often called the reactive part. It's the survival or the flight or fight portion of our brain. Um, and that lower part of our brain deals with crisis, stress, um, very, very basic survival. And this reactive part of the brain gets activated uh, when we are very stressful or in times of crisis. Um, and I think many of us, like I said, because we often work in crisis-laden environments, this part of the brain gets very, very uh, well developed. So neurologists teach us that neurons that fire together wire together. So when it's continuously called upon and activated, this reactive part of the brain, we can get stuck in reactive mode. So we'll notice this because we will find ourselves snapping at others, we're seeming short-tempered, we're reacting to things we wouldn't normally, we really see the subsequent systems of compassion fatigue. This emotional exhaustion can also look like job dissatisfaction, hopelessness, detached responses to our families. Um, and so it, it affects us or has the ability or capacity to affect us in many ways in our lives. I also want to, you'll see the very bottom bullet point of this slide refers to the illness narratives um, and refers to the work of Dr. I Arthur Kleinman. So as a medical anthropologist, when I was in graduate school, I studied with a, a doctor and a professor named Arthur Kleinman. And one of his uh, major contributions to the field was that he did this really cool work where he made the distinction between disease and illness. And I think this, his work um, provides a nice framework for us as we're talking about how our work experiences impact and sort of intersect with our life experiences. Uh, Dr. Kleinman made the distinction between the two, between disease and illness. And he posited or thought that disease referred to the very biological basis of poor health. And in the case of compassion fatigue, I would say the biological or the brain and central nervous system and stress hormone bases of compassion fatigue. And then there's this illness component. So for Dr. Kleinman, the illness component was the stories that people tell themselves or the narratives that they have around their health, around their wellness, which are often culturally and socially situated. So for example, um, Early on in my career, um, I identify as someone of native descent. And so I worked in an organization, some of you may uh, know it or have heard of it, and who knows, maybe some of our participants may work there now. It's called NARA, the Native, Amer uh, native American Rehabilitation Association. It's in Portland. So the work that I was doing with um, the traumatized individuals that I was working with also really intersected with my own understanding of my own mental health and our mental health as a community. Um, so I think that's a really an interesting paradigm to think about how we consider our own mental health, our mental wellness, and how it intersects with our life experiences. So for the next slide, so again, um, talking about the relationship between our personal histories and our professional choices and behaviors as we're thinking about compassion fatigue, as we're thinking about how to heal and support ourselves and others from healing from compassion fatigue and becoming or facilitating our own resilience, I think it's helpful to think about the connection between ourselves, our histories, and our professional choices and behaviors. Um, early research shows that adults with adverse childhood experiences or multiple adverse childhood experiences are more likely to choose a helping profession as a career. I think. Um, I'm really excited for more research to be done on this. There's not a lot out there, at least not a lot that I could find. Um, there was one uh, study in 1993 that studied social work students. So most of it had, has been done in the realm of social work. Um, but I would imagine that we're gonna find that that information that folks with adverse childhood experiences are more likely to choose a helping career also applies to many different kinds of helping professions. Um, so just even this correlation emphasizes the importance of the need and the opportunity to take good care of ourselves at work 
and how it might offer us subsequent opportunities for growth and healing. So we can consider our career choices as opportunities for corrective emotional experiences or to have appropriate responses to inappropriate situations um, to facilitate our neural and behavioral plasticity to potentially heal any attachment wounds um, folks might experience who also are healers themselves or human services professionals themselves. And just the healthy we are, the healthier our professional communities are and the better quality of care that we can provide for our clients. So thinking about thriving, we've kind of, sorry to be such a, a bummer and harsh everybody's mellow. We've been talking about really negative concepts up until now. So now we're gonna start talking a little bit about what we can do to support ourselves in thriving and being resilient in our workplaces and elsewhere. So we're going to talk about MI and CBT and neuroscience and how we can apply these sorts of ideas to ourselves in our workplace environment. So I always think that, I mean, it's important professionally to turn the lens outward, right? And to be um, good professionals and to have appropriate boundaries and, and do, do all that in the workplace and have skills and techniques that we can offer our clients um, and offer uh, other staff members if we're in leadership or, or supervisory positions. Uh, but I also think that we can use many of the tools that are employed with, with clients or patients that we can employ with ourselves. So specifically, I think about motivational interviewing and CBT or DBT as really having some helpful uh, thoughts and practices for us um, as practitioners and providers. So when we look at motivational interviewing, uh, one of the core sort of components of motivational interviewing or MI is this notion of ambivalence. So as we're thinking about, and we'll talk more about this later on in the presentation, developing our own wellness practices, developing our own practices to support ourselves from healing and being resilient in the face of workplace stressors and compassion fatigue. If we can think about our own ambivalence related to self-care, related to making changes, um, and those of us in the helping uh, medical social service professions, I think really understand and are aware of how difficult change really is for all of us. I always sort of say like when I'm doing MI trainings that um, when talking about ambivalence, I know personally that it's not good for me to eat Ben and Jerry's and chips and salsa for dinner, but as a bachelorette, I get to do that as someone who lives by myself, doesn't have anybody to cook for. Um, but I also know that it's not good for my health. I also know that, you know, I wanna live a long time. I have both of these sort of pro and con for change. Um, these arguments going on in my brain. I know I should change so I can live longer, be healthier, fit into my skinny jeans. Um, but I know that Ben and Jerry's and chips and salsa might be part of my coping skills. <laughs> um, so I think if we take that sort of notion of ambivalence and apply it to our own thoughts about self-care and wellness, um, so we all read a lot. There's a lot out there in the world about self-care. I don't think we're suffering from a lack of ideas or information about how to care for ourselves. It can just be pretty difficult to do. So that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about things we can do and think in the moment that we don't have to carve time out for after work. Um, so MI kind of offers us this notion of normalizing and accepting our own ambivalence related to taking care of ourselves and making changes in our lives. There are reasons for and reasons against it. And that's a perfectly normal part of change. So also thinking about from MI readiness to change, considering as we're considering what types of processes or practices we might institute. Again, we'll talk more about the specifics of that later thinking about our own readiness to change. So thinking about why might I make a change or why might I continue to cultivate self-care practices? What's in it for me? What are the benefits? 
Um, and then thinking about our current change supporting resources. So how and when have we taken care of ourselves in the past at work or in personal sort of situations if it translates to work? Um, what kinds of successes have we had in the past? Kind of keeping those in the forefront of our minds and our memories. We start to get hard on ourselves or sort of hopeless about our work. Um, thinking about do we have any models? For professional resilience? Um, is there anyone in our organization that we look up to? Anyone um, who's sort of a, a figure, a public figure that represents resilience um, to us, professional resilience? And what sorts of current resources might we have, internal and external? So right now you're all using an external resource, which is a free webinar from ATTC. So yay, good for you. Um, so just sort of taking stock and thinking about what sorts of resources you might have externally, outside of yourself and your thought processes. So it might be books, it might be people, um, it might be any kind of media, and internally in terms of your own coping skills and your own history. Um, so keeping that in the forefront of your mind as you're thinking about how to thrive at work in difficult situations. So thinking about uh, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT informed self-care, um, so what does CBT offer us that we can apply to our own processes and, and health and wellness at work? So one of, I think, one of the big teachings of CBT is this power of insight and awareness, excuse me, which we also um, are referring to as mindfulness, um, which correlates with, with sort of Eastern philosophies, but this idea of metacognition of thinking about what we're thinking, of cultivating a practice of self-reflexivity. Um, and so when we're thinking about that practice of self-reflexivity, I'm just thinking, um, I know that we all probably have a lot of experience with mindfulness in the world now that that's also becoming a really, or has been a really popular topic in terms of the power of mindfulness and how we might apply it to our own lives and our own work experiences, one of the ways, or one of the things we can think about when we're thinking about recognizing and naming our reactions and our feelings, because this can be very liberating and healing in and of itself, is in mindfulness, they often use the acronym RAIN. Uh, RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and non, non-identification. I always wanna say non-attachment, but non-identification is the end. So recognize means recognizing that we're having a feeling. I think many of us probably already do this, already have pretty well-developed skills, but continuing to hone those skills and practice that when we're in the moment at work, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling frustrated. Um, I always call folks at work my work family, because they're very similar. I spend more time with them than I do with friends and family. Um, and sa the same as our families, we don't get to often, unless we're hiring um, everybody, but we don't often get to choose everyone that we work with. So sort of like our families, but we still have to live with them day to day. So folks that we have that kind of relationship with have a really unique ability just to I don't know how to say it, but just to kind of set us off and as much work personally as we think we've done on ourselves, situations and things can sort of set us off. So this rain, this idea of recognizing and acknowledging our feelings can kind of bring us back to center. So naming what you're experiencing, um, wow, this is me being really angry right now, can help us develop or buy a little time between that activating event and our response or speaking out or saying or doing something that might not be beneficial to us later. So the recognize, um, so the allow is rather than push a negative emotion or push a negative experience away just to kind of allow that this is something that's happening, not necessarily indulge, but just allow it rather than push it away. Because sometimes as we all know, resistance or pushing away merely makes the opposing force stronger. Um, and think about investigating. So thinking about why am I feeling this way right now? And of course we can't all do this in that split second, but maybe later on in the work day or at another time, um, 
why did I have that reaction? Are there physiological factors? Um, am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating well? Um, how's my physical health? And also, what do I really need? Where did that come from? What sort of needs in the workplace might not be getting met right now? Um, and then this N, this non-identification. So remembering that we are not our thoughts and emotions, um, that our thoughts and emotions, I always think of they are to ourself or ourselves as weather patterns are to the planet. They rise, they fall, they come, they go. So that's one way of sort of considering or having non-identification about sometimes some of our experiences that can be difficult in our professional life and our reactions to them. Um, also this idea um, that's very uh, prevalent in CBT, this idea that we can't control others very frequently, but we have more of a chance of controlling ourselves. We have more of a chance of controlling ourselves in our own environment and our reactions to what's happening. So thinking about um, this idea, one of the things that helps me um, at work when I'm thinking about and has helped many of my clients um, when thinking about challenges or impossible challenges at work, thinking about right versus effective. And it's something they say frequently in DBT. Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Because we can't always be both. And I think having that right effective conversation with ourselves um, really connects to knowing what effective means. So sort of internally knowing what our workplace vision is, um, what our mission, personal mission, not just our company mission, but what our personal mission and goal is. Um, for me, um, that's my integrity as a woman, um, as a woman of native descent, as a professional. So when I find myself dysregulated or really upset at work, and I don't really have the capacity to use that front portion of my brain, that higher reasoning when I'm dysregulated and, and in the moment, um, that to me can often be my, my compass, my, my north, sort of true north point that I can easily come back to is do I want to be right or do I want to be effective? What does effective mean? And for me, it, it means having professional and personal integrity. So figuring out what that might be for you um, is a way to help you develop some resiliency, help all of us in our workplace. So let's move on to talk a little bit more about thriving and talking about self-care basics. Um, so I have this quote up here from, um, well, attributed to Buddha. I don't know him. I never talked to him. So, um, but it says our sorrows and wounds are healed only when we touch them with compassion. So with research about compassion fatigue or empathy fatigue, um, one of the core components or practices that has been shown to be healing and preventative for, event, for empathy fatigue or compassion fatigue is having compassion for ourselves and for others. So when I think about compassion for ourselves and others, just to unpack that a little bit, that can look like speaking kindly to yourself. Um, it can think about having non-isolating thoughts. So non-isolating thoughts might be remembering that this is an appropriate reaction to an inappropriate circumstance and remembering that anyone might feel this way in the circumstance or remembering that other people have gone through similar experiences and circumstances. So having those sort of compassionate feelings for yourself to me also ties into having non-isolating feelings. Um, so cultivating that compassion. And then connection, that's another sort of component or practice that has been shown to be healing for compassion or empathy fatigue. So connection can mean connection to others in the workplace, other people that are safe and supportive, inspirational, other colleagues. So really just sort of fostering those opportunities for yourself. Um, and then coping. So developing good coping skills and health supporting practices for yourself in the workplace and outside of the workplace. So in thinking about the neuroscience of self-care, um, again, like we said, like I said earlier, this idea that neurologists teach us that neurons that fire together, wire together. So cultivating good behavioral health, I always like to call it behavioral health hygiene. 
um, can be really strengthening to the frontal part of your brain and the systems that regulate our ability to reason and use compassion um, and help to balance those higher reasoning skills with our flight or fight or flight. So the practice. So I think there's a reason why we call it practice, remembering that it's not just something that happens once. Good behavior, behavioral health hygiene, whatever it looks like for each of us is something ongoing that you practice just sort of like flossing a couple times a day, something that you frequently do. It's not just kind of a one and done thing. So just thinking about sort of what we've done today, what we've talked about today, or what we're talking about, we're not just sitting here passively. So we're contributing to our own wellness practice. We're promoting our own neural and behavioral plasticity. So we're acquiring new information, exposing ourselves to familiar information that facilitates neural integration and knowledge, beliefs, experiences, supporting our overall health and well-being. Oh, good. I'm seeing a good question come in. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, whoops. I did not mean to do that. Let me see if I can back up. Oh, I did it. So facilitating neural integration of knowledge, beliefs, and experiences that support our overall health and well-being. Um, we're developing new neural pathways and new neural networks potentially by just sitting here considering this information, envisioning ourselves doing healthful things. We'll talk more about what those things might be for each of us. And by doing this work, we're predisposing ourselves toward resiliency and toward bounce back at work. And let me just, okay, next slide. So thinking about moving forward and sort of getting to these questions about what good behavioral health hygiene might look like. Um, if we were all in a room together or if we had an ability to be more interactive, I would ask all of you to tell me something and maybe it's a question we'll pose at the end um, that you do that you think supports your own behavioral health and wellness. Um, so we might think about um, developing our own board of directors. That's how I call it, uh, trusted others. Um, those might look like healers, um, therapists, coaches, um, whatever that might look like for you. Um, for me, I have a therapist. I always say I'm a, I'm a proud provider and consumer of behavioral health services. Um, and I have a business coach that I work with when I think it's useful. Um, whatever that looks like for you, um, it might look like um, whatever the work you do with the therapist, it might look like insight work. I really like um, this notion of somatically oriented treatments for um, those of us who are survivors of trauma um, or even working through workplace trauma. Excuse me. Um, so, I think somatically oriented treatments are getting a lot of press. There are a lot of different kinds. Um, Hakomi is a big one. Another big one out there is called sensory motor psychotherapy that you can research by Googling those terms. Um, and I always think it's funny um, because my therapist is a sensory motor psychotherapy practitioner. I find that super helpful and useful for me. It's very effective. But when I was telling a friend about it, he thought I said sensory motorcycle therapy, which I think would also be rad because I really like motorcycles. <laughs> so if you can do it safely, I think that would, all, oops, I think that would also be a great, uh, perhaps, modality. Um, but sensory motorcycle therapy is the work of um, Patricia Ogden. Um, it's an offshoot of Hakomi. Um, so one of the benefits, I think, of somatically oriented treatments like this are that they subvert our intellect um, I really respect and admire what Freud has given to us, but I feel like he's been dead a long time. Um, so the sensory motor therapies are sort of taking that a step further and realizing that you might not need to sit and talk about your trauma over and over again, year after year after year after year to resolve it, because it can be real slow going. The sensory motor psychotherapy um, and other somatically oriented treatments in their way manage to, I believe, get to our brain and central nervous system to develop that resilience and plasticity by not necessarily talking about it. 
And I don't want to, we're, we're running close to time, so I don't want to say too much about exactly what those are. Um, but if you want, I can also give Aaron and everybody else resources. I'll give you a resource list um, that folks can go to um, and sort of do their own research about these kinds of treatments and whether or not there are practitioners in your area. And even now that um, somatically oriented treatments are becoming more commonplace, many um, providers and practitioners I'm finding who accept insurance also provide somatically oriented, oriented treatments like my um, who's a licensed social worker and has been in the business forever and ever so is on all the insurance boards and takes my medical insurance as well um does the sensory motor psychotherapy and so actually this year i know this really happens but my insurance got even better so i don't even have a copay um for this amazing work um and it's just billed as therapy um so uh we'll talk about and I can list resources and places you might go to see if there are practitioners in your area um, and where you might go to find more information. And then the idea of alternative medicine. I always think about even using the word alternative medicine. Um, I'm not sure if that's facilitating an ism um, because I would imagine that the things that we consider alternative like Chinese medicine and acupuncture, um, I don't know that that's very culturally appropriate. I'm sure in China, they don't consider acupuncture alternative. And I also wonder if in India, they consider, if they consider Ayurvedic medicine alternative, um, maybe traditional medicine might be a better, more appropriate uh, name. But whatever it looks like to you, whether it's alternative medical sort of practices or healing practices, um, it might be massage, it might be Reiki. Um, oh, I see somebody saying you can call alternative medicine something else. Connie Hansen, I'm not going to click on that. Just because if I do, I'm afraid I'm going to get lost because I don't know how to run my PowerPoint very well. But we'll get to that at the end. I want to know what you said, but I can't read your whole question from here. So um, we'll see what Connie offered for an alternative to call it that. And thank you for that. So whatever those healing modalities might look like for you. Um, oh, complementary medicine. Thank you. Yes, complementary medicine. So whatever might also complement the other healing resources or medical treatments that we go to. Um, I also think about psychonutrition can be another resource or way to condition our mind and heal our central nervous system. Um, research is showing that there are dietary factors that are powerful regulators of neuroplasticity and contribute to the health and regulation of neuronal activity. Um, like anti-inflammatory diets. Again, you can go on the web and look up anti-inflammatory diets and again, I just want to say I'm not a physician, I'm not a dietitian, so before you make any dietary changes, check with your, with your provider. Um, but this idea of anti-inflammatory diets, of amino acid therapies to support and facilitate production of dopamine, serotonin, um, other neurotransmitters. Also, um, research has shown that, remember that, that, so funny, I always want to call it BDSM, but <laughs> the... Um, the the brain factor the protein that i was talking about earlier um, that helps to regulate and build our nervous system that also has been shown that physical exercise increases the facility the body's facilitation and production of that component by three threefold um, consistent physical exercise and in that research physical exercise meant aerobic exercise of 30 minutes or more five times a week so different kinds of exercise can facilitate different kinds of healing. So really just thinking about a holistic approach to our wellness at work. Um, so we already talked about illness narratives. I felt like we had to give a shout out to the scholars and the authors who teach about interpersonal neurobiology, trauma, mindfulness. There's so much wonderful work out there that's available to us. Um, I also want to say that speaking about interpersonal neurobiology or our own experience of, of trauma or difficulties at work and putting it in a biological framework or a scientific framework. So even for those of us who aren't practitioners of those methods, I think it can be really um, unstigmatizing and approachable. I know that there's work in addictions talking about using the importance of using medically accurate language 
to talk about language or to talk about addiction and how that can be very um, fostering of healing for folks and unstigmatizing. I think the same thing about our behavioral health and our behavioral health in our workplace and treating our own compassion and, and empathy fatigue, that if we're able and if we have access to the resources, thinking about those sorts of processes um, in medically accurate or biological language can be helpful um, to healing. So I'm not gonna read through all the authors and the scholars um, that I mentioned here, but just because this is gonna be up on the website as well, um, and this is gonna be um, available to us, I felt like there were people that we just had to give a shout out to that we couldn't end without talking about. So just a quick through, um, like run through, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the work of people like Bonnie Badnock, who writes The Mindful, Ther the Mindful Therapist, I think she's based in Eugene, Oregon, uh, Tara Brack's Radical Acceptance, um, these folks like Bessel van der Kolk and Babette Rothschild who talks about, who talk about how trauma and experiences live in our body. Um, I think it's important to read these works with an eye toward how they can support us as well as how they can support our, our patients or our clients. Um, and looking about, at the interpersonal neurobiology sort of literature about the learning that we're doing that our brains and central nervous systems heal in relationship to others and to our environment and in response and interaction to um, can be really motivating uh, to give ourselves sort of that little boost that we need to heal just knowing that the more we we control and create an environment for ourselves that supports that the more likely we are to be healthy um, so then I wanted to talk about resources like um, certain other things that we might do in addition to reading we always think about reading um wondering if like technology and apps are supportive of our behavioral health i'm not really endorsing any of these i'm just throwing these out there as ideas to explore to facilitate our own wellness um so some of the apps i'm familiar with um and that i've used before are calm fabulous foodify um, that help to cultivate a practice of self-care and wellness. Um, they can offer brief, short meditations um, that I find useful because I have the attention span of a gnat. So a three-minute meditation is totally my jam. So, um, so these apps can sort of be helpful that they can provide. I call them um, exercise snacks or mindfulness snacks. Um, oh, good. Thanks, Mindy. I see Mindy's got some YouTube um, recommendations. Um, and these apps are not free, I should say. Um, I think you get a free trial, but uh, they come with like a monthly cost. Um, and so Fabulous even, um, it's out of Duke University, I think, a behavioral economist and a research institute um, out there. So a lot of these are based in, in research. So I think that's pretty cool. And some other ideas in terms of resources that you might create for yourself, um, thinking about what's going to be helpful without further taxing our depleted resources of time and energy. So maybe thinking about if you're a practitioner who uses motivational interviewing, MI practice circles, because then you get to MI each other and you get to be the recipient um, as other people are practicing. Um, any kind of physical activity groups um, or wellness classes that you might take, um, book or study groups. I also like the idea of monthly self-care skill shares um, that I uh, sometimes facilitate in my practice where the focus is we just talk about uh, what we're doing. Um, and you can even see like with the chat how all the ideas are kind of popping up like popcorn. Um, so I think it's a wonderful idea to learn from each other um, and inspire each other about what we know and what we do to care for ourselves and facilitate our own wellness. And here are some web resources, um, some interesting articles. Uh, so how mindfulness actually changes the brain. There's a really cool article, Urgent Versus Important. Um, I guess Eisenhower sort of had a practice um, of how he ran his presidency of, um, differentiating urgent from important um, and I think that can be real key in our own stress management is learning how to do that so this is kind of presented for the layperson in a wellness sort of perspective not from a political perspective 
Um, Compass Point is super cool. It's a nonprofit leadership organization or consultancy out of Oakland. So they've got a really cool self-starter kit on their website. This neuroplasticity journal is free. Um, boy, you could fall down the rabbit hole if you're into that stuff. Um, into, in their articles, lots of articles about neuroplasticity. And if you search like mental health on their website, you can get a gabillion, not a gabillion, but a lot of articles um, in peer-based uh, scientific journals about um, neuroplasticity and behavioral health. Uh, Bounce Back Project is another cool website. You know, and I'm sorry that that didn't come through very well. This is a six pillars of self-care matrix that you can create for yourself. Hold on, let me go to my copy so I can tell you what the words that got cut off say, because I can't remember right now. Hold on. Um, and the other thing, I don't know, um, Bia and Aaron, if I have the capacity to, um, put a PDF up, but if I do, I will put a PDF up um, on Hello? Yeah, not, uh, we can uh, put it up later uh, in our website, but not uh, right now. Not right now, but later. Yeah. Okay, so what I will do is provide for later um, a PDF of a blank um, copy of this um, Six Pillars of Self-Care um, but you can see that it's broken up into these six columns, rest, nourishment, cleansing, grounding, energy, and protection. Might be a little too woo-woo for some people. So if it is, just substitute those categories with something that's meaningful and resonant to you. Um, hold on, let me bring this up. And then uh, the blank sheet. So on the left, the words that are cut off are the first row is physical, the second row is mental, the third row is emotional, and the fourth row is spiritual. And so just thinking about how to fill in each of those matrices is kind of a fun exercise for our own self-care. Um, and then here is my contact information. If you have any questions or comments about uh, anything I presented today or um, my work at all, um, there's my cell phone and my uh, email address. So I think we're at time, Bia, is that right? Yes, perfect. Uh, that, that's wonderful. Thank you so very much. Do I need control? Okay, so I'm getting control back of uh, our slides. So uh, before we go into uh, any questions, comments, discussion, uh, I want to reiterate of some of you that uh, always uh, are attending our webinars, we need your feedback uh, really well to keep this work uh, supported. So you're going to receive uh, two surveys, one right after the webinar and then another one in a month. We really appreciate your feedback uh, on it and help us to uh, keep uh, doing what we are doing. Okay, so uh, we are going to go now to questions. You just type them in uh, the chat box. So we say, we see we already have some here. Uh, just to clarify uh, some logistics here. So we cannot send things by email. Everything is going to be uh, till Monday the 29th in the website. Uh, we uh, do not offer a CE for presentations uh, today, uh, just for clarifications. Um, okay, let me go back. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so for questions. So uh, our first question that is not on the logistic domain, uh, it relates to giving an example of what uh, would be um, a good behavior health hygiene. So, uh, okay, Kelsey, thank you for that question. Um, so in terms of good behavioral health hygiene, I feel like we could probably have a whole webinar just devoted to that. Um, so sorry, I had to skip over that so quickly. So an example of good behavioral health hygiene, and it's gonna be different for each person, of course, whatever's resonant for you and effective for you. Not every human body responds the same way to every medicine or healing intervention, but good behavioral health hygiene might be going to your therapist once a week. 
um, good behavioral health hygiene might be cultivating a practice of positive self-talk, like we were talking about early, speaking to yourself compassionately. Um, good behavioral health hygiene for some of us is um, physical activity, moving our body, because we know um, that it's good for our, our individual brain and central nervous systems, and, and we can do that. Um, so good behavioral health hygiene is sort of any kind of a consistent practice or habit that you develop and cultivate that's supportive of good behavioral health or mental health. So, um, so those were some examples, just like exercise, eating well, maybe good sleep hygiene. Maybe you've heard that, um, going to bed at the same time, which I'm terrible. Many of us are not so great about, um, getting a good night's sleep, making whatever, um, adjustments to our environment that we need to, to the room to make sure it's dark and cool to facilitate good sleep. Um, so good sleep practices might also be an example for me or for any of us of behavioral health hygiene. Um, so hopefully, Kelsey, that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, clarify that I spoke too soon. So uh, Eric McGraw that works here with us sent the, our address, uh, our uh, website address, and uh, she will also send to everybody in, uh, the evaluation plus uh, slides uh, when she says PDF means the six pillars document and other information uh, on uh, Monday. So that will be, uh, you'll be getting this, uh, everything on Monday. Uh, that being said, uh, I also had important uh, opinion or like a suggestions here of uh, free apps. Um, mindfulness Coach, Headspace and Inside Timer are also important uh, options for people. I have been using uh, Inside Timer, it's very interesting and it's free. You have an option of non-free, but Inside Timer has uh, many Tara Brach, um, uh, meditations and speaking, uh, um, recording speakers from her, it's very interesting. Um, so, uh, that being said, we are pretty much on time and uh, I will, I uh, guess, let everybody go, except we get another question here because we won't have time to entertain much more discussion. Okay. And I just want to say thank you to everyone and just commend all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules for carving out time. Um, to attend the webinar and, and consider this topic. So, so thank you for that. Thank you, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your participation, uh, attendees and speaker. And uh, next, uh, our next webinar would be acceptance and commitment therapy for substance use disorders with Dr. Jonathan Breaker. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.